So tonight we're, we're celebrating the uh, contributions of individuals and organizations toward our ultimate goal and vision, and that is furthering a free, space-bearing civilization and promoting real uh, space development. And we've seen quite a few presentations of people who share that vision and that dream uh, with us. So uh, we're going to shift things around just a little bit tonight um, in deference to our honored speaker, uh, Laureus. Um, she just got off a plane yesterday from Tokyo, and it is 8.06 a.m. for her. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to get her with Kirby to, you know, noodle on some ideas about high-speed suborbital point-to-point, um, which is always an interesting topic after you've been on a long flight like that. Um, so she'll give her speech first, and then we'll move into the, uh, the awards uh, presentation. Um, after Fred's award, we'll continue with the annual NSS awards uh, presentation, and uh, Mark Hopkins, who I'll introduce in a moment, will uh, will be introducing uh, introducing Lori. Um, you know, I I've made a point to make you all aware of the people who have really made this uh, this conference happen, and uh, you know, one of the things that can make a really good conference not so good and uh, be like a negative takeaway for folks is if the audio video doesn't work. And I think that we've seen that the audio video has been pretty much flawless throughout our, our conference. So uh, I'd like to give a, a, a shout out to Hector and Samuel from, uh, from our media. <clears throat> and of course to, uh, to Alvin and Chris from uh, Moon and Back Media, who have been recording all the, the key events. And uh, I think it's awesome. Um, there's Alvin right over there. Um, and I can't wait. I can't wait to go back and look at, uh, look at some of the video of, uh, of General Bolden speaking with Dragon in the background and, and, and all the events that we had at the, uh, the gala the other night, some of the key speakers. I mean, it's really going to be cool. Um, this is awesome because for the last, what, three, four days now, I have been trying to sync being in the same room with this person so I can give her the shout out that she deserves. Um, the person who really keeps, like I said, keeps me out of trouble, keeps things going at uh, headquarters, and who I think you've all seen her at registration uh, here, who has just really been uh, uh, very, very patient and uh, very friendly, always has a smile on her face. And uh, as I said, keeps us running smoothly. And that's Tanisha Forts. And uh, I think I see her in the back there. Yes. I got you finally. I got you in the same room. So I, I really appreciate everything that uh, that Tanisha does uh, does for us every day and does for me personally. Um, I'd like to ask Josh uh, Powers to come up to the, the stage for a few moments. Josh, where are you, Josh? There he is. Let me just say a few things about uh, about Josh. Um, Josh has a full time job, and it's not the NSS. Um, the NSS is his other full-time job, um, and I briefed the board of uh, directors today um, on the level of effort that he has put into this conference has been phenomenal. And more importantly, really the leadership that he has shown has pulled this together in an extremely short period of time, um, really starting from somewhat of a dead stop and, and not having, you know, assumed the role of, of chair. Um, he had been shepherding it along, uh, and as I said the first day, he had one request that, uh, you know, he have a strong staff, and he got that through, through Deb and Angela, um, who we've recognized. So, so as we uh, come into the closing days of, uh, of the ISDC, um, I, I just can't stress to you enough the, the level of work that, that he's done, and, and, I, and I really want to celebrate it by um, sharing a fact with you. It's somewhat breaking news. We got it at the board of directors meeting today, um, our attendance, our registered attendance for the event as of this morning was 925. Now that number may not seem, you know, it may seem arbitrary to you. That number has exceeded 2011, 2010, 
2009, and the last time that we were in Washington, D.C., 2008. So um, that is just a testament to, uh, to everything that, that Josh has done, and I, and I just think it's, it's phenomenal. So Josh, please uh, share a few words with us. Well, I'm not sure how happy I am about uh, exceeding the 2008 number because that makes me think they're going to want to bring ISDC back here again soon. <laughs> I'm not sure anyone on the team is ready for that. Uh, so what I just wanted to do very briefly, and then we'll let uh, Lori get up here so she can uh, go get some rest at home, is uh, to, to just on behalf of the ISDC team make uh, one more acknowledgement. Um, so you've all heard about uh, Debbie and Angela and I don't know that we've, uh, we've mentioned, we certainly just mentioned Tanisha, I don't know we've mentioned Darcy uh, Chuba, who works uh, with us at AMS and has done some great work behind the scenes to get ready for the conference. But what, uh, what we wanted to do was uh, take an opportunity to turn the tables on our executive director and uh, thank him for his support for the ISDC. So you've heard about some of the things that uh, the volunteer team has done, but there's a, a lot of important things and details that Paul has to put together and they wouldn't have happened uh, uh, without him. So the first one is just all the time spent on the phone, dealing with emails, working with uh, our sponsors and our exhibitors and our, uh, our speakers, not just on the phone and in email, but traveling all around the country. Uh, Paul made a number of trips uh, out to, uh, to uh, interest sponsors in our conference, and uh, they were very fruitful ones, and some of you are probably here hopefully enjoying dinner tonight. And made a huge difference for us, uh, and that's what makes this kind of a conference successful and brings uh, these sort of people uh, in to, to be with us here. So none of these things uh, that we've done here, all of this great work that we've done to put together the conference would have meant anything if we hadn't got those speakers and those sponsors. Uh, you know, the Air and Space Museum uh, is a great venue, but to have John Glenn and Scott Carpenter uh, and Buzz and Hugh Downs there with us is uh, a credit to the work that Paul did for us. So just wanted to ask you all to join me in thanking him for his efforts. I didn't, uh, I didn't see that coming when Josh said, I have a, I have a few words to say. I'm like, okay, I can, I can roll. Wow, I, I appreciate that, uh, but I, I just reflect it back onto the team. I mean, it, the, the, the credit goes to, uh, goes to them. And, and to the NSS leadership, and to the NSS board of uh, directors, and the NSS uh, governors. Um, we, we, we just have, we have great things ahead of us, and, and, I, and I've been telling some folks that, um, you know, our, our wonderful night at the gala the other night was a, a tangible and symbolic um, event showing us, uh, showing us the way ahead. So, uh, so we will move along. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, Mark Hopkins. Uh, Mark Hopkins is our uh, chairman of our executive committee. It's the highest office within the uh, National Space Society. He served as an officer um, within the NSS and uh, its parent organizations uh, in one position or another for the last 30 of the last 36 years. Uh, he re received degrees in economics from Caltech and Harvard and has written numerous space economics articles. And uh, Mark has been a, a huge champion of uh, one of the things that falls right into our vision, that of space-based solar power and, uh, and of working with uh, Japan and India and uh, really moving uh, that concept forward. So Mark, uh, if you'd like to come up to the stage. Actually, the only thing we, I've done recently that was really good was uh, having something to do with hiring Paul. So, um, <laughs> I'm here to uh, introduce uh, Lori, and I've known her for a long time. I met her, uh, she came to work at the National Space Institute about the same time that I suggested a merger between the L5 Society and the National Space Institute. And that foolish suggestion, 
well, I guess it wasn't a foolish suggestion since we're all here, but it sort of consumed me for the next three years. And during that time, uh, in, in negotiations, and during that time, uh, as part of those negotiations, I made it uh, my, uh, one of the things I had to do was to really understand the staff at the National Space Institute so that I would have maybe some advantage during the merger negotiations. Uh, Laura came to that outfit as a receptionist, okay? And I watched her during those three years rise within the National Space Institute staff until the end of that three-year period. She was at least number two in that organization and was fundamentally in charge of everything except the merger negotiations. During that three-year period, I gave her the nickname of the Queen of Space. And after a while, it occurred to me that uh, that wasn't really a good enough title. So I started calling her the Empress of Space. After the uh, merger was over with, just a few months later, uh, we had informally agreed during the merger to create a family of organizations, uh, which was done frequently in those days. Uh, we don't do that much now because the legal regime has changed. But one of those organizations was Space Cause, which was going to be the lobbying arm, while National Space Society was going to be an educational organization. And I was uh, president and CEO of that. So the first thing I did was to talk Lori into working half-time for Space Cause as our executive director. And the other half-time, she continued to work for the National Space uh, Society. Well, Lori did this fantastic job, and, and Space Cause was booming. And as a consequence, within a year, when it came time to select the uh, next executive director of the National Space Society, Lori, for that reason as well as many others, was the candidate that was selected. And she stayed with us for nine years, which is substantially longer than any other uh, executive director of the National Space Society. And she, when various executive directors, former executive directors get together, they generally uh, give her a rough time for being more foolish than they were. Uh, <laughs> so why did, uh, I, I, was, you know, I was thinking about this, and I actually thought about it a lot, particularly in those days, but a little bit ever since. What was Lori's secret? And I think the answer is unbelievable people skills. I've never met anybody. I've been around for a while, as you can sort of see. Uh, I've never met anybody that had better people skills than Lori Garver. Next thing Lori did was she, after leaving NSS, is she went and started working for NASA. And not to the surprise of anybody that knew her well, she rose rapidly in that organization and became an associate administrator. Well, Republicans won, which generally means that NASA administrator and NASA associate administrators go and look for other jobs uh, because they're political appointees. So she left, and she went on and did uh, all kinds of wonderful things. But what struck me as the most interesting, uh, or most impressive, was she became the lead civilian advisor, for, first for the John Kerry presidential campaign, and of course he lost, and then for the Hillary Clinton campaign. Now you may remember that Hillary Clinton had this uh, little tiff with Obama during the uh, uh, nomination period, and eventually uh, Hillary Clinton lost after a very rough campaign. Now, most people, like me, and all of the political pundits and people who help campaigns, you know, their candidate loses, they go home and say, okay, I'll get a job next campaign se season. But not Lori. <laughs> but a few weeks, by some magic, I suspect I had some of you have people skills, she was now the lead civilian space advisor, policy advisor for her previous rival, Obama. Well, obviously Obama won. As a result, Lori led the transition team uh, uh, for the Obama campaign on, on concerning space, and subsequently came, came the deputy NASA administrator. Now, most people, when they have sort of a career which starts with receptionist and in so far uh, with a deputy NASA administrator, 
you know, they are sort of nice to people that they met on the way up uh, on occasion. But uh, Lori's different. When Lori became deputy NASA administrator, she went out and frequently and strongly and favorably in all kinds of venues telling everybody how wonderful the National Space Society was. And this was of enormous benefit to us because it increased our prestige anywhere, everywhere. And it really demonstrated one thing, which is of something that everybody in this organization needs to understand, and that Lori is one of us. <laughs> Furthermore, Lori is the key proponent of commercial space within NASA today, ever since she's been the deputy administrator. Now, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that she got some of these ideas concerning commercial space when she was executive director of the National Space Society. So uh, we can pat, our head, pat ourselves on the head for that as well. Um, but let's think of what, just what this means. Right now, there's a major paradigm shift going on within, within space, away from the traditional way of doing things to the commercial way of doing things. And there's every reason to believe that that paradigm change is going to be successful. And it will have a huge impact on what we do in space and eventually the uh, destiny of the human race. Now, I thought about this hard, and I don't say this lightly. But I was thinking the other day that, you know, what will future historians think about all this? And so here I'm going to make a prediction which is actually fairly safe because I'm going to be dead before anybody can show I'm wrong. Uh, but anyway, I suspect that, and I strongly suspect that future historians will eventually reach a consensus that the individual in the 21st century, a 100-year period, who was a NASA employee and who had the most influence on what we do in space, on what humanity's drive into space was, and hence human destiny, will be Laura Garber. <laughs> so, I want to bring to you the strongest proponent at NASA of the National Space Society, truly one of our own, the Empress of Space, Laura Garber. Thank you, Mark. And I can see we're about out of time. It's great to have you. <laughs> That's about as good as this is gonna gonna get. So um, I, I, I have to uh, say that while you were doing those merger negotiations with Glenn, those three years, Mark, this was my strategy. I was just working behind the scenes to figure it all out. Um, it is uh, very much appreciated, though, that introduction, uh, Mark, best, best of all time. I did come from Japan, so we'll uh, take the Empress thing. But I don't know why anyone thinks I would be tired. I don't get tired. And when anyone asks me uh, where I get my energy, I, I certainly say I had great role models at the National Space Society, including you, Mark. The uh, commitment that you have made personally to uh, space development over your life is unmatched in my view. So thank you very much. Um, as Mark pointed out, I grew up at NSS. I, I joked recently, I carted around two uh, little kids when I was working at Space Society. Now I just have to cart around two Blackberries. It's a, a not, not a good trade, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, as a banquet speaker, I, I know that you're all actually probably more tired than me because it is already morning in Japan. But I, I know Charlie was with you during the Dragon 
docking, and so people have told me he's already given you the whole uh, pitch on what NASA's up to, but I'm going to quickly go through that because I have the opportunity to speak to the choir, and the choir needs to know uh, the notes that, that we're on at NASA. I, while I'm proud of a lot of the progress we've made, I agree with you there that it's been a long time coming, and we're looking forward with your help to you continuing to keep us sharp and continuing uh, us on this path. So um, how perfect that you had here at the Space Society the head of NASA during the docking, in my view, that moment that is uh, ushering in the new space era that wouldn't have happened without you. And uh, I truly mean that. I, Don Pettit, I thought, did a great job at the press conference right after the docking where he said this was the golden spike moment. And I think that's a good way to put it, too, as we uh, open up free enterprise uh, to space. So. I know Charlie enjoyed his time here, and I was sorry I wasn't here for the banquet for, for Buzz and his colleagues, and of course it'd be have been great to see Hugh Downs again too, but uh, I'll, I'll keep coming to ISDCs no matter what job I'm in. So I'm gonna quickly go over the uh, path for NASA, then I'm gonna share some personal thoughts. I put together a top 10 list. I do so love the top 10 list. Is anyone tweeting? I'm really, I'm really hoping there's nobody tweeting here to Brad. <laughs> You have some work to do outside. You have to plan next week's trip to ISU, so don't be here, because um, I'll be a lot more open if no one's tweeting. And I, first, though, would you tweet before you leave that Lori Garvez uh, gotten this far on her winning personality? That is, a, that is gonna come a, as a shock to a few people at NASA, I can tell you. I can tell you, Mom. <laughs> but, but we're gonna go with it. Okay, so um, Onward and Upward, that's the name of your conference. That's why that's on there. It, it, the charts come out and I say to my staff, this is my winning personality. Onward and Upward, that's not the name of my talk. Well, it's because it's a theme of the conference. Fabulous. So uh, America's innovation for the future. So we believe at NASA, and I, I said this this morning, for those of you who weren't at the uh, Heritage Talk at uh, on the Space Society and the beginnings of the society. My job really is at NASA more limited than it was when I was at the Space Society. Space Society, our goal, right? I can say our because I'm a member, is the um, creation of a spacefaring civilization. NASA's role in that is the pointy end of the spear. We are looking to lead farther. We believe our uh, program is doing that. We believe that we should be investing in those technologies that are far reaching and that will return value to the private sector. As Mark said earlier in the uh, reception, that is what's going to create the economic value for ultimately space settlement. Is that NASA's goal? No, but our goal is, as you look in the Space Act, to develop uh, commercial space, to study the environment of the Earth and the, uh, the atmosphere and uh, the space environment. So that is what we're doing. And we realize we're in tough economic times. We do not have 3% of the budget like we did in the Apollo days. We've got about a half a percent, but I can tell you from managing things at the National Space Society for those nine years, we got a decent budget at NASA. We're doing okay. We've got $17.7 .7 billion, and um, that's, uh, that's a, a nice amount of money to invest in a space program. If you total up every other space agency on the planet, they come to 75% of NASA's budget. So let no one tell you we are not leading the space effort for the world and continuing to do that. I will point out that our buying power has gone down in the last couple of years. The president has requested increasing or flat budgets. Congress has uh, cut those budgets significantly last year by almost a billion dollars. This is how we break up our budget. Have you heard we're not doing human spaceflight anymore at NASA? That is a very bad rumor, people. The purple is human spaceflight, okay? It is over. 55% of our budget. Uh, science is, as is historically consistent, um, it's actually a little high right now, 30, 35%. And we have put in space technology again at almost 5%. Again, that's the investment we believe is critical to, funding, to, to uh, helping us with our own missions as well as the uh, making our aerospace industry more competitive generally. And aeronautics is down at around 4%. It's only um, half a billion dollars. Within human spaceflight, gosh, you'd think we spend all our money on commercial crew, wouldn't you? 
Do we? It turns out we do not. International Space Station is 38% and exploration, meaning Orion and SLS, are another 35%. The lion's share of our human spaceflight continues to be on those large programs. So what enables this? Commercial spaceflight, less than 10% of the human spaceflight budget. But what is our core human spaceflight program? Obviously, it is the International Space Station. We came in. We believe strongly in it. We believe it is our toehold for the future. It is where we learn how humans live and work in space. And we want to use it as a way to help develop markets. We've had 400 experiments just in the last year on Space Station. But it is also that anchor tenant, right, for the market of transportation, both crew and cargo. But we are going further again. The president outlined a mission to an asteroid 2025 and uh, Mars by the mid-2030s, and we're actually doing something about it, building the SLS and the Orion to take us farther than ever before. But the new space economy is what we believe all of this uh, allows us to do, and LEO is that. As we opened up all parts, so again, comparing to uh, the railroads, uh, and I did learn this at the National Space Society and with my economics background as well, Mark, that uh, these are the investments that are going to truly pay off for this country and for the world. Uh, whether you go back to the limits to growth uh, conferences that you spoke of in the 70s, uh, it, this is something that these, these are just facts. <laughs> Sometimes facts matter, as we say. So all across the nation right now, U.S. industry are building vehicles to go to space. Names like Dream Chaser, Cygnus, we know the, the Dragon. Uh, has just been successful, and we have other vehicles behind it. Liberty, I don't want to leave anyone out. CST100. What is what is Blue Orange and Causer? New Shepard. But we also have, as I said, 35% of our budget almost on space science. Just uh, the, uh, currently, we have 60 missions in operations, 26 uh, in development in all our divisions, astrophysics, heliophysics, earth sciences, and planetary sciences. The James Webb Telescope, as you may have heard, had some cost overruns, so we did have to make some hard choices this year. We believe it was important to complete what we started with the James Webb Telescope. We're committed to it, and we uh, had to make some trade-offs with the Mars program uh, in order to fully fund the James Webb Space Telescope. But we believe all our science divisions are extremely healthy, and we are trying to focus them on doing those things, not only that are important um, uh, to us here at home, but return and drive technology as well, doing things in ways that overall uh, return to the taxpayer. So the technology budget is a key part of this that we have, as I mentioned, reinvigorated. The technology budget at NASA had gone down to next to nothing. We're very happy, although, again, the president requested over a billion dollars these last couple years. We're at about $600 million, and we believe this underpins our future missions as, as well as those of our partners in the private sector. And so, in conclusion, we believe we truly do, with not only our 12 budget but our proposed 13 budget, have it balanced uh, and stable top line for NASA. We're committed to maintaining that U.S. leadership in space. We're committed to following through on the bipartisan agreement we have with Congress uh, to have this balanced program. I believe it lays the foundation for making more discoveries and for out-innovating, out-building, and, and for our future. That, that is the uh, outline of our NASA strategy, and I truly believe that we would not be this far without the Space Society, but I wanted to um, focus on the future beyond the budget projection that I have to work on every day at NASA because this is the Space Society, right? And it is the 50th anniversary. We just I was just in Ohio with Senator Glenn, and we were um, celebrating the 50th anniversary of his flight. Hi, so I did a top 10 list on what the next 50 years space activities will look like. So 50 years from now, the top 10 things that will be happening in space. So number 10, and not I think a lot of you will get these. Number 10, Virgin Galactic has sponsored the first rotating space habitat, hosting the last L5 Society meeting. Per their bylaws, the L5 Society officially disbands. 
then I'll just add that'll make the National Space Institute the winner in the merger negotiations, Mark. We win. Number nine. The U.S., the President of the United States gives the first day of the Union address from a lunar base. And she, <laughs> it's not going to take 50 years, is it? Uh, names it Newt York. A petition is immediately circulated to rename it Griffinville. <laughs> Number eight. The band, Bill Nye and the Science Guys, play the first rock concert from the lunar base after the speech. An investigation, only, only Dave's going to get this, an, an investigation is immediately launched because the band's lead singer is the former NASA, de NASA deputy administrator's granddaughter. <laughs> Number seven, solar flares disrupt computer transactions on Wall Street, causing shares of X Corp to drop for the first time in history. <laughs> Number six, in an effort to increase funding, NASA now has 52 field centers, one in each state, plus Puerto Rico and Guam. <laughs> Meanwhile, the District of Columbia still fights for statehood. <laughs> Can't help with my political remarks. Number five. While geysers in Yellowstone have long since been dormant due to global warming, sibling tour guides Maya and George Whitesides lead throngs of visitors to see the geysers on Enceladus. <laughs> Maya and George's parents, George and Loretta Whitesides, and their good old friends Dave and Lori decide to stay home and watch the grandkids. Number four, the Webb Telescope discovers a supersized Earth with obese microbes. <laughs> SpaceX immediately announces they will set up the first McDonald's on the planet if NASA will commit to them supplying Happy Meals to future visiting astronauts. <laughs> Immediate cries of corporate welfare and yeah. favoritism erupt. Number three, National Institutes of Health researchers on ISS3, yes, we still need a better name, <laughs> discovered a cancer vaccine 15 years ago. But lawyers are continuing to negotiate royalty arrangements and intellectual property rights. <laughs> a little frustrated. Is that winning personality coming out, Mark? Uh, number two, number two. NASA develops an asteroid shield that can withstand anything, possibly except the assault from Congress. Congress. Congress declares that the shield must contain material from each congressional district. <laughs> Cost increases and schedule delays thus lead to the shield's cancellation. But. SpaceX announces they have already built the shield. <laughs> and the number one development in space activities 50 years from now, the inflatable Bigelow Space Hotel hosts the 81st ISDC. And yes, it will still monopolize your entire Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> Luckily, that's the 14-hour plane ride from, back from Japan last night, so I could really like, I was really getting punchy when I was thinking of that list. Um, so you can see, National Space Society and our ideas will continue to shape the future. It's been my privilege to work with you for the last 29 years, and I do look forward to the next 50, uh, and I did leave time to take your questions, any questions that you have. So thank you for having me.
and I can probably hear people. I don't, I don't know if there's a mic. Well, that's interesting because uh, those charts come from the CFO's office and because of the way our accounts are structured, education which is that that is formally within our education office at NASA is what you're looking at there. Mission directorates really do education beyond just the uh, 120 million, I think, which is that, that requested amount. And, and in fact, of course, this country spends billions on education and this is, uh, STEM is a major focus for us. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to leverage education dollars beyond that percent, although of course we would always be happy to uh, um, have more money. I'm here to defend our budget request, not to ask for more. That could be your um, uh, job. One thing I also learned at NSS is, you know, you got to work for who you work for. And I, uh, this, this is something that I feel is one of the true benefits of NASA. Everywhere I go, you have students who are in fields because of what we do. So I guess I sort of believe every single dime that NASA spends is, is somewhat on education, but uh, happy, happy to have more done. Should I, uh, go ahead. I can't um, really see, so. Which uh, Democratic uh, candidate in the future is gonna make you the first female administrator of NASA? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I'll tell you a little Story. One of one of the winning things about my my personality is my uh, determination, and uh, Osiris Rex was chosen as our discovery mission, uh, Frontier. new frontiers mission, uh, maybe six months ago. And I remember when I got the briefing, I said to the people who gave me, "Oh, it returns in 2023. That'll be perfect. That'll be my last year at NASA." And they're looking at me. I said, "Well, you know, we have." five more of Obama, and then eight in the Hillary Clinton administration, and by then, uh, made my run, so. <laughs> Just in case anyone thought they were gonna outlast me. <laughs> oh, now we're getting crazy. That's crazy talk, Larry. Hi, Larry. What else, right here? So NASA has just an enormous legitimizing power because of who it is and the credibility it carries. But so far, the national debate and most of what we hear from NASA still uses the word space exploration. So the words we use here that says development is not there. But it's not like NASA is not doing meaningful things there. It's doing interesting things on solar electric propulsion, propellant transfer, commercial space. When will we see NASA spin those into where that's going for space development and change the national character of the uh, Do you want a job? <laughs> so this has been a huge frustration to me. I can even tell you on, on this speech, well, granted, I didn't use a ton of what I got from, from them, because I knew what I wanted to say to you guys. It keeps being that, space exploration. Top 10 list, this is space exploration. It's like, no, space activities, you know, it is, I have to edit it every single speech. You are, you are right. I'm glad someone else is noticing because no one's so thrilled that I keep noticing. It is so ingrained in what we do. And to some extent, the NASA, you know, we are mission driven as we talked about this morning. This is our history. We do want to keep uh, exploring and doing new things. So I talk about new things that uh, I think others believe that is purely just, just exploration. And the government's role is not the space role, uh, the same role as the space society. And um, I, I think most people at NASA, frankly, wouldn't understand your question. It's, it's just, it's not something that we worry about. And I have this unique background, so I do. Uh, but it's, um, it's not universal by any extent. So, so maybe if we have a public affairs opening, you might want to apply, I don't know. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
somewhere out right in the back there. Is there any movement to try to remove some of the debris? It's becoming a really bad problem. Yeah, so in the National Space Policy, we talked about what agency, that's how we have to start. Before we do anything, we have to talk about who's gonna do it, which is fair. Uh, and NASA's role is purely the technology development for it. And while I believe uh, the role of doing it are, is not ours, we frankly don't, you just see the line there for developing uh, space debris removal. It's, an, it's not a big part of our, our line either. I think ultimately that might be something that if we can get the technology there is a private sector development as well. There could be a market, obviously commercial satellites are concerned about debris as well. We could also put in, I think, policies that incentivize folks to have less debris. We are at least starting to do that with keeping um, enough fuel aboard so you can put them in different orbits or bring them home kind of thing. So uh, we have more work to do there, I would say. There isn't, uh, we're not hiding it. You would. You would see it. Yes. Um, I'm a big fan of the uh, Office of the Chief Technologist. Could you uh, describe what, what's happening there, where it's going, budget increases, um, the hopes for it the next couple of years? So I'm glad, glad you're a fan. We, it's one of the biggest things I'd say we have actually accomplished successfully bureaucratically was to carve that out. And Bobby Bowen had just a great start for two years, and Mason Peck is doing a great job. As I said, we've requested a lot more than, than we've received in the past, and this year we're actually pleased that Congress didn't cut this account by as much, certainly as they've cut other accounts that we also think are important. So um, we have every intention of continuing to invest in technology, and the office is uh, the place that we're gonna do it. If you listen to the president talk about space, I feel like every time, people parse his words very carefully, and I really listen as well, because there's times when it comes up and we have not known it was gonna come up, so there's not a script, and he personally speaks to space technology every time. He gets excited when you're in the room and talking to him. This is what he wants to do. He wants to do new things. You talk to him about uh, propulsion technology to get to Mars quicker, that, that's very exciting to him, and these technologies, he believes are the, the big contributor, I think, that NASA is making to the greater good and to the economic base. So you will not see from our side anything other than continued support for technology. Chris. Hillary, you know, one of the things that's been <laughs> <laughs> frustrating here um, is uh, the whole thing with COTS and the success story. Now, one of the questions is, is that there seems to be some pushback from Congress on the use of FARs versus the Space Act agreements and things like that. You may have noticed. Um, so one of the questions is, is do you think that, that this is a fight that, that you know, NASA can win? I know that the administration has been pushing for this to carry heat forward, but there seems to be pushback. So I was wondering what you think of the odds are. Let's see. With the Space Act agreement, and $370 million, we just not only developed a capsule, but a rocket that went to the International Space Station with our astronauts on it, docked, brought supplies, and will return in a couple of weeks. Really, Space Act agreements aren't the best way to get things done in a quick way. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, we're we're going to be able to communicate that message. Uh, it, it's been frustrating, frankly, that we haven't. I mean, past programs haven't gone so well. Anybody know what we spent on Aries One? Six billion. <laughs> five point five point nine billion dollars. It, it was a you know cost plus contracts, far base contracts are good for some things, but for things you have done for fifty years, probably don't need them. The incentives are there to do things differently, uh, and I, th I think we've really, we've proved so much this last week, or I, I say we, but it, so much, so much credit goes to SpaceX. But NASA did a great job with it, and you, Alan Lindemoyer and his team 
have been phenomenal at uh, keeping <laughs> NASA working well through space agreements. So, uh, and you know, COT started way before we got there. So this isn't something that is in any way partisan. We, we believe it's a, it's a great proof of uh, that work. And, and I truly believe that we're uh, gonna, gonna make some more progress on that, hopefully, and, and not be restricted into what we can do in the future. Yes? Once the, once the James Webb telescope is launched, are you gonna consider turning the hub over to a consortium of universities and research labs so the ones that don't have access to web will have another telescope to use? That is a great uh, question. I have not heard it before. I don't know what the annual operating costs are in Hubble. If we could get them low enough to where somebody would would want to do that. But of course, the web isn't an optical telescope anyway, so I'm not sure we would be, it's, it's not a trade one for one necessarily. I'm pretty sure we'll keep Hubble going as long as possible, and I for one would be thrilled if there were other researchers who want to use it. We have such a backlog of researchers to use it, I would think that there wouldn't be a lot of question. But I know those are trades for the future, and I would just think it would be, a, as with so many other things, if you can get the ops cost down, then it's really worth it to, to have the payoff. One, one of the interesting things about NASA and government in different ways we incentivize or disincentivize certain behaviors, people want to build new things all the time. And yet, in many cases, it's all about the data, right, or the science that we're getting. So. These trade-offs are, are something we need to make on, I think, more of an economic basis sometimes, that while you can continue to get this data on this, specifically Earth sciences, I hadn't thought about it as much with, with Hubble, but we're not talking about turning off Hubble anytime soon. Yeah. Currently, uh, 2013 is the last launch window where a mission to Mars is scheduled. Uh, where in NASA's list of priorities to unmanned science missions to Mars rank, and given the lead time they require, what would you say is the earliest year we might expect a resumption? So we have the Mars Science Lab, I should have mentioned it, oh my gosh, August 5th, it's going to be very exciting, uh, landing and Curiosity rover. We have instruments that we are continuing to work with for the ESA missions, whether 2016, 18, uh, actually occur. And we are reformulating our Mars plan right now. We have still a larger budget for Mars than any other planet other than Earth, uh, within NASA, something like $150 million a year. And we certainly want to optimize our next missions for either the 18 or the 20 window, depending on how large emissions come out of the reformulation and how long um, it will take for their development, if we can get the, uh, them done in time. But we intend to utilize those opportunities uh, and continue the very, very successful robotic exploration of Mars. There is no question that that has been one of the things that has most returned new science, that has most engaged the public, and that is going to be precursors for when humans go. So we are committed to that. We continue to believe that we can do it in a way that maybe doesn't cost two and a half to four billion every time, and look to really benefiting from the experience we already have and going there in a way that uh, will not only do science that's new, drive technology that's new, and ultimately, um, allow us to continue the rest of the science portfolio. So the flagship programs are what's become a problem, and the Webb Telescope, while we are strongly supportive of it, it's going to be nearly $9 billion. And that is just a very tough thing to take out of uh, NASA's science budget when you have half a percent of the public's tax dollars and uh, of that 35% for science, you start, you start getting down. But we believe it's a very healthy program. We have every intention of continuing robotic exploration of Mars in it very healthy way. I mean, compare that rest of the world. I mean, we've successfully landed, I think, 13 times, or had successful Mars missions 13 times, so we have a great history of it. Yes? Now that uh, NASA has successfully commercialized uh, commercial space transportation, it is time to successfully commercialize space solar power. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I would say that we needed the transportation first, right? Why do the transportation if you're not gonna use it for something worthwhile? Uh, this, is, this is the point as we drive the technologies, lower the costs, uh, the, uh, and allow us to open up new markets. So to me, one of those new markets is clearly going to be uh, solar power, and we could not be doing that if we hadn't lowered launch costs. We need to lower them a lot more to enable that. But these are enabling technologies. I think that's the point of what we're doing. And so will that be NASA's job? No. Someone's going to come in who wants to uh, privatize that and make money off of it. But they're not going to do that if the price to entry is too high. So that's a government classical role, in my view. Michelle had a question. Yeah. Oh. OK. Ma'am, um, I say this is a Tea Party conservative, but I hope that whoever the next president is, we have Lori Garver as the next administrator. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Tea Party doesn't have a candidate, do you? I can tell you that I've talked to people who should know. My question is this. We've talked about fiscal responsibility with the COTS program, and now we are having all the success with the commercial crew program. When are we going to transfer that over to the science side and realize that we have programs that are too big to fail? When we have programs that are over $7 billion over budget, and anywhere from 10 to 14 years behind schedule. Um, as someone who looks at it from the outside, from an economic point of view, ma'am, we cannot help but see that this is absolutely crushing other parts of our science program. And I can tell you, as I go around the nation talking to school kids, Mars is the thing that really gets them going. And Webb isn't going to take the pictures like the Hubble will. So is there something in line that's going to say, OK, we've done everything we can for Webb. It's going to go up again. I'll bet my house on it. What, what, is there a, some type of plan that eventually says, OK, we need to rethink this strategy? Well, two different questions, uh, I guess, related. The, the first part about the plans to do science in ways that also take advantage of the private sector and doing things differently is something I've, I really have worked hard on. If it's of, although maybe not that apparent yet. The um, couple of things we have done, and the technology office is helping lead this, but the uh, lunar data purchase, doing things in that way, is uh, we want to do more and more of that. Look, I'm trying to think now about figuring out a way to do that maybe with some asteroid detection, since we've got some private sector interest now. Um, and things like the Earth Sciences missions, not just doing a decadal mission a decade. You know, there, so it's going to take like 37 years to work through our decadal missions. We can't do every mission as a billion dollar mission. So we are looking, and we just got a big policy change for host to payloads. We actually put it in our venture class um, uh, opportunity announcement, the, the AO, that you could uh, compete for hosted payloads, something we have not allowed before, to try and do just that. Get science in new ways and not everything be hundreds of millions, much less the billions um, of web. As to a future plan uh, without web, we do not have that. But I think Congress and the President have been very, very clear, no more cost overruns. So it'll either be your house or uh, the, <laughs> the web. But, OK, I, oh gosh, I'm really supposed to wrap up. I will take one more question from the back. Uh, Laura, you, you may be aware that we had many students from overseas, from, from, many from, uh, from uh, Turkey and even Bulgaria and Romania. And they all had excellent ideas uh, about uh, how we can do things better, make orbital space settlements, even space settlements that travel to the stars. So this country is still a beacon for, for developing and great minds coming from everywhere. How would, you, how would you feel about a modification to ITAR so that you would be, you know, that you were able to cooperate more with uh, this, this town and, and be able to work more with town in other countries? 
Well, we at NASA, of course, work cooperatively uh, with other countries, probably as much more than any other agency. We have 400 agreements with international organizations right now. ITAR reform is a priority. The administration has made a very tough run at this. I think a couple of years ago, people said, well, no Democratic administration could ever do this. And we've really, really tried. We've got legislation on the Hill. We've put in place those things that we could that didn't need legislation. So we believe in it. And to the extent we are allowed legally, we're, we're doing it. If you can't work together in space, where can you? Uh, this just seems rather obvious as well. So um, thank you very much for having me. I am going to stay and give the next award, I believe. So um, I have the honor to present a Space Pioneer Award tonight. I know there are others, but uh, they asked if I would give this Elder Statesman Space Pioneer Award, I think, um, for the first time being given. And it is being given this evening to Frederick I. Ordway III. So Fred's, Fred's career, I'm just, you can come up here, but I'm still going to talk about you, Fred. So Fred's career has spanned from America's pioneering rocket engine company, Reaction Motors, to a member of Werner von Braun's rocket team, and later to NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, and eventually to the Department of Energy, where I met him, from where he retired. He has lectured on space throughout and the world and published wildly, widely, wildly, 35 books and over 300 articles. He's a lifetime member of NSI. This was a, I don't know, weeks-long contentious point in the merger negotiations, whether we would honor NSI life members, and we did. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, and a 71 year, see, I don't forget a thing. That's actually my secret, Mark. <laughs> Ask Dave Brandt. Um, he served as technical advisor to the film 2001 a Space Odyssey and continues as a longtime involvement with the Space and Rocket Center uh, in Huntsville. I personally met Fred 29 years ago. Every two weeks during those first few years at NSI, I would handwrite the checks and make an appointment to go see Fred Ordway at the Department of Energy so he could sign them. So I learned at his knee all those years. You beguiled me with stories of the rocket team and Werner von Braun and his many exploits. And you then, as well as a few others, like Mark, took a chance on me 25 years ago to promote me to executive director. So you've been a friend and mentor ever since, and it's an honor to present you the Space Pioneer Award, National Space Center. Thank you very much. I want to thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you all very, very much. It makes me very proud to have been a member uh, since the beginning. I was at the beginning of the National Space Institute. I've been, a, a, as he said, over a 70-year member of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. I joined as a young uh, student member when I was 12 years of age. And I've been just an absolute fan of space. I work professionally in it. I've also been a collector of it. Uh, and I want to uh, say a, a word about the importance of somebody listening uh, from the next table. I had a large collection of uh, science fiction magazines. I grew up with science fiction, and I collected. I was all the way back to the 1920s, the science uh, fiction uh, uh, issue of Science and Invention. Uh, I had a complete set of amazing stories, science ones of stories, planet stories, cosmic stories, the Marvel, it, all of them. And that's, uh, I have been giving my collection away uh, to the Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And I'd be giving part of my collection to the university, the library, the Salmon Library at the University of, of, of Alabama in Huntsville, Space and Rocket Center and the university. But what I had was a, this huge 1,000 issues, roughly, of pulp magazines, 
going beginning back in the 20s and 30s. Every single one you could think of, practically. And I didn't know what to do with them because the, neither the university nor the Space and Rocket Center would take them because they couldn't handle them. They would, that required too much uh, money for restoration of the collection, digitizing the collection. So they sat for years and years and years in uh, uh, acid-free boxes. I was uh, on, for many, many years, I was on a uh, Harvard University Library Oversight Committee. And we would meet four, maybe five times a year in, in Cambridge. And I had always taken the selection from my interest uh, with the restoration of, 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 of early books and magazines and art and so forth. I was a very part of that particular group. We all divided ourselves into various groups. And one day at a social event, uh, we were sitting there talking with, I was talking with the deputy director of the Harvard Library System, and I happened to mention my big dilemma of this big collection of uh, science fiction magazines, pulp magazines, and I didn't know what to do with them. And somebody overheard that, a newly hired librarian who was a science fiction space buff and said, came over to our table and said, I don't want to impose, I'm not eavesdropping, but I, I've just started working here, and one of the first things I learned that the vaunted Harvard Library, the largest university library in the world, does not have a science fiction pulp magazine collection. <laughs> oh my God. And then we began to talk, and one thing led to another, and slowly over about a year period, we organized all the, my magazines. They all ended up at Cambridge at the library. The library digitized the entire collection of a thousand pulp magazines, and both of them were like that one. And they also it were insisted on uh, restoring, deacidifying, deacidifying de uh, page by page, every page of those thousand pulp magazines and they claim now that they have a, perhaps a, another additional lifetime of 100 years. The university made a great honor. They had a dinner with the president. It was featured in Harvard Magazine as a treasure. The Harvard Literary Review gave it a long article, and the Harvard Gazette gave it a, a, a major attention. And so I felt completely at rest, proud that it went back to my alma, alma mater, but I always remembered the importance of somebody listening to what you're talking about. Thank you very much. This is a special token of our appreciation. It's a pyramid with Mars, the Earth, the Moon, and the Space Station. We're giving you Lori because of her fantastic vision on concerning commercial space, which is, of course, our vision. And I've also noted in the back of my mind that one of the most important things for presidential candidates is vision. So, Lori. Thank you. 